I'm assuming since the door has been closed, we are about to begin. Uh, welcome, everyone. My name is Luisa Białosiewicz, and I'm a professor of European governance at the University of Amsterdam. And I wanted to welcome you all tonight on behalf of the Amsterdam Center for European Studies that is co-sponsoring tonight's discussion. We're co-sponsoring it together with the European Cultural Foundation, whose banner you see here, uh, actually as a series of public debates on the future of Europe leading up to the European elections. So this will be the first, actually, in a number of events. And um, I wanted to thank um, Frieser Pearson from uh, the ECF for launching this initiative, and actually my colleague who is here in the audience, uh, Hido Snell, for kind of putting us in contact and bringing this initiative first um, as an idea and making it possible. So thank you for that. I wanted to actually start by giving the floor briefly to Friso so he can say something more about the series and about the ECF's mission in this sense. So if you want to step up um, before... The European Cultural Foundation, as the name says, is a European foundation more based in Amsterdam. And perhaps a lot of you might never have heard of it, but actually we exist for 65 years already. Um, it is that we do a lot of work abroad. Actually, we're a brand making organization, so we brand a lot of cultural activists um, with a little bit of money, with networks, uh, because we believe that without culture, our continent, because we work a lot broader than just the European Union, will be just a continent, culture-based continent together. So we like to connect people, ideas, and networks together, which we do by sometimes providing a little bit of money, sometimes providing a little bit of insight, and a lot of time by providing context to one another. We do so with a few things particularly, which is Princess Magid Award for Culture, which is a annual prize that we hand out in October. Um, and we have a tagline, as you might perhaps see on a little banner behind me, for this year, which was democracy needs imagination, because we all know that going to the ballot boxes won't suffice actually to keep the democracy alive. We need our imagination to work on. And some other people might have understood how to use their imagination in perhaps destructing democracy better than we have in maintaining or refining democracy a little further. So we thought it would be very worthwhile to have a series of perhaps not only debates, also workshops on democracy. So this one kicks off uh, with an analysis by a few eminent scholars that are sitting right in front of me. And next week, on the 18th of April, we invite you for a workshop with Italian writer Giuseppe Porcaro, who published the book Disco Sauer, which is a, in his own words, dystopian love novel about the European Union, but we might turn it around and also have a session here where we actually think about a utopian love story for the European Union and other countries. Why all this? Because elections, as you all know, are coming up 24, 26 of May. And we thought it would be good um, to also have another voice came through the loudspeakers and only the ones that we'll be discussing tonight. That was uh, very long for a very short notice. Thank you. <laughs> Thanks so much, Friso. And we really would like you to think of these events as a series. And as you know, as Frisa said, I mean, one of the intentions also of tonight is not just to, of course, describe what the spaces of the far right are, what are these movements, how can we understand them, but also think of an alternative politics and alternative imaginations that, you know, we may kind of um, hopefully engage quite quickly since the European elections are in May already. Um, but certainly next week's workshop is aimed in that direction. So... Um, the title of tonight's evening, The Spaces of the European Far Right, we wanted to think a bit more broadly who and what is the far right today. So images like this of young and also not so young uh, men dressed in black usually have occupied the front pages of many European newspapers. This one is actually a... Um, a demonstration by an Italian uh, new fascist group called Casa Pound in my hometown of Trieste. It's actually down the street from my house. Now, they look you know, reasonably numerous here. There were not that many of them, even though this was one of the largest manifestations. 
but the, about 1,000 participants were countered by over 6,000 um, participants of a counter manifestation. And this is one of the things that we'll talk about is, you know, kind of thinking of the real numbers that we're talking about here. But when we're talking about the spaces of the far right and far right movements, we shouldn't only think of young men with shaved heads dressed in black. We should also think um, of other things. These spaces are also made of little girls dressed in blue and pink. And the image that you see here comes from a poster, a series of posters and pamphlets that were used to advertise an event that took place just over a week ago in the Italian city of Verona, and it was the World Congress of Families. Um, it was initially under the direct patronage of the current Italian government, of the Ministry for Family. Um, subsequently, the government withdrew its direct sponsorship following both national and international outrage. But the Minister for Families, who was the kind of promoter of this event, may, you know, remained as to um, the city and the province of Verona. Um, just as at previous congresses, so this is actually the, the World Congress of Families is an um, organization based in the United States, but that has branches around the world. Um, previous congress was in Moldova, and the one in 2017 was held in Budapest, a very important occasion for um, Viktor Orban actually to promote his own vision, not just of families, but of Europe and a Europe in crisis. And so the slogan of this Congress last week was also very much focused on that. So a Europe that, and I quote, is losing out in the competition between civilizations and indeed whose very biological survival is at stake. Now, if these appeals sound disturbingly familiar, it is because they directly uh, speak to what you know, we may see as they're much more extreme and violent manifestations, such as the imagined battles for the salvation of European civilization and the great replacement, um, you know, kind of imagined by figures such as the Christchurch murderer. Um, and I wanted to bring up this poster, which seems so innocuous, and it also struck me because of the, you know, kind of the European stars that were kind of firmly emblazoned on it, because I think it allows us to think about the proximity, a very dangerous proximity, between the far and seemingly not so far right, a proximity that is growing closer. But there's, of course, many other examples that we could bring. And I wanted to kind of close these opening comments with um, uh, a couple of points made by the late Umberto Eco um, already in the 1990s, in the early 1990s. So in 1995, he wrote an essay on the New York Review of Books called Ur Fascism. And in that essay, he warned that it would be much easier for us, he wrote, if there appeared on the world scene someone who would say, let's reopen Auschwitz. I want the black shirts to march again on the streets of Rome. But that would be quite simple, and life isn't that simple. So already writing then, he noted that the peril of the return of fascism in Europe, but not only, is not only to be found, let's say, in its most visible, kind of most spectacular, most extreme manifestations, um, whether online or offline, but it lay rather, he said, in what he called the return or emergence of a much wider way of thinking, um, a much wider way of feeling, and what he called a group of cultural habits. Um, cultural habits that seep far beyond the still thankfully limited, and I think it's really important to stress that, a uh, still limited range of far right and fascist groups and movements. So the aim that we had with tonight's discussion is to better understand not just who and what these movements are, again, online and offline, but also this kind of wider group of cultural habits, if we want to borrow Echo's term, asking where um, the spaces in which, um, you know, kind of they're appearing are today, as I said, both virtual and real spaces, and asking what far-right movements do in these spaces. How do they make strategic use of both virtual and real spaces, um, of online fora and real physical presence on city streets? 
And finally, you know, again, going back to, to Echo and, and this example that I'm bringing to you, thinking about how more respectable political forces make use, maybe mirror even their strategies. So the three experts that we've um, asked to speak to us tonight will provide us, I think, with a nice range of perspectives from which I hope we can begin to uh, understand this. Now, the way we thought to structure the evening is to have three short presentations of about 10 minutes from each of them. We will then give them a chance to very briefly respond to each other and then um, have, we hope, quite a bit of time for questions from the floor, because we really want this to be a discussion and a debate um, with you in the audience as well. So what I'd like to do is actually call our first speaker, um, Andrea Mamone from Royal Hallway in London, who is a historian of transnational fascisms, both past and present. And we've asked him to give, yes, a both historical and kind of a contemporary perspective on these movements and especially their connections, um, past and present. So Andrea, I'll leave the podium to you and um, I will flag you when you're getting close to your 10 minutes. So the pointer is here. And if, I mean, if you want to stand here or walk with the microphone. Okay, I use my phone because being from southern Italy and especially from Calabria, keeping my timing is always very problematic. <laughs> but <laughs> I know yeah, the, the real stereotype of the southern Italian I am. Yes, exactly. Okay, ciao. Uh, I want to thank the U European Studies and the European Cultural Foundation for this event because I think that is very important and there are a number of similar events running across Europe today, not just in this country. Uh, indeed, I'm in a sort of rock band tour going around and <laughs> you're talking about this theme, which probably are not the most uh, pleasant ones sometimes, but doesn't matter. So I want to start saying that uh, this topic, as you, as you understand, is extremely important because it has an impact on our lives. So up to maybe 10 years ago, people were not were aware, but less scared or less worried about that. Now, this is clearly something impacting uh, politically and socially our societies, but also culturally and even economically, especially when these parties gain power. Now, if we start from the uh, slogan, from the title of this series, Democracy Needs Imagination, I think that we need to look at also at what type of imagination this party, these movements have. Now, the main idea, and I start, I should start. So, it starts. <laughs> <laughs> so, uh, there should be, okay, that's the slide, yes, perfect. Uh, so, uh, basically the idea that even scholars had for a long time was that these movements were nation-based only. So, eventually the fight for anti-fascists, for example, for some, some activists, for some politicians, uh, was uh, national. So, when at some point people realized that Le Pen and Matteo Salvini and Wilders and some others were trying to run together for the previous European election. So people, even journalists, started asking, well, that's the first time. How is it possible that these movements are talking each other? Well, that's completely wrong. I and mean, it's not something new, not at all. I will try to, to, to show some historical example of this trend. So eventually the fight, but also the understanding of the phenomenon has to be transnational, pan-national, European, maybe, maybe global in many ways. Uh, so a way to understand why these parties are able to talk today each other, to create links, not just parties, uh, better, uh, extremist cultures, social movements, and people. They talk each other, they interact each other, they create links. So what they have done, starting from fascism, was they were creating an imaginary. Now, when we talk about the interwar years, we need to keep in mind such specific time period. So it was a period with diplomatic tensions, military issues, then war. So interactions were possible, were there. 
But let's keep in mind, it's not the post-1945 world, and it's not the post-communist era, so the end of the Cold War. So these, some of these movements, some of these ideas, try to consider the nation as part of a wider unit, where the unit was a sort of imagined community, was a sort of imagined space, which was both national, but also pan-national. In some cases, identifying Europe as their ideological, social, cultural landscape. So, if we start from fascism, now there is an obsession in many, many, many countries, in many, in many media, to talk about German Nazism usually because I mean the big enemies, the bad guys. But the first movement was the Italian fascism. So it was Mussolini who invented the word. And in my personal perspective, Italian fascism has been better to be used after the war because it was not so associated with the Holocaust and so on. So even Italian fascism, which was 100% Italian in many ways, even if ideas cross border before Mussolini uh, invented fascism, there were some streams in Italian fascism considering fascism as a universal idea. So something which was Italian, but could be also Latin, Mediterranean, European, and global. These are examples of some publication, like Anti-Europe, Anti-Europa. So if we have in mind this name, Anti-Europa, Anti-Europe, someone can believe, okay, they were against Europe, they were for Italy. No, anti-Europe because they believed that they were against such liberal democratic Europe. And then we have association like the Cour for the universality of Rome. So considering Rome as a sort of universal empire and fa connecting fascism directly with the Italian, uh, the fascism directly with the Roman Empire. And there were a number of other publications like Gerarchia. Gerarchia was the, the, the review edited by Benito Mussolini. At some point, Gerarchia ran these issues on fascism outside Italy, fascistic-like ideas outside Italy, and they were inviting fascist leaders to write. This ended up in a famous uh, fascist conference in Montreux. These, they were never able to create uh, an, an, an international association. But it's interesting because some of the people involved in this, then they became war collaborators or even carry their ideas after the war. So the main imaginary is not always the nation. The main imaginary, imaginary is the brotherhood, is the fascist brotherhood. So it's an idea. So if we jump to the post-war years, we have people imagining a non-necessarily Italian or uh, national world. He is Julius Evola. Julius Evola was a baron, was an aristocratic guy, uh, very radical. He influenced people today like Bannon, for example. And Evola is one of the people who uh, was able to bring a non-national imaginary also into the post-war. Now, consider that Evola is the most read Italian intellectual among extreme right-wing activists abroad. He is translated in many languages. This is one of his books, Men Among the Ruins. The ruins, the disaster of the modern world. If you think about this, it is like a quite common theme that the modernity, the modernization, our contemporary world is bad. And so they want to propose something different. Another example, immediately after the war, some far right people, including Mosley, for example, or Jockey, an American who wrote Imperium, they realized that keep talking about the nation all the time keep talking about fascism all the time, with in mind the idea of a sort of expansionist, military fascism, was not working very well. Because fascism had the blame. So these people were in a political ghetto. The political ghetto means 
emerge, uh, they were out of society, often, not always, but often. So they started imagining a sort of pan-European ideology or a pan-national ideology. People like uh, Jockey, writing Imperium, all these are, almost all of these are translated today, circulated, so they are circulating in English, including among some alt-right groups in the United States. So Imperium was a pan-fascist post-war space, including Russia. For Jockey, America had to join after because it was too liberal for him, too market orientated. Uh, Mosley as well were, was translated and so on, calling for this Europe a nation. So even some of the themes used today are not completely new. Then we have in a number of countries publications, neo-fascist publications, starting using uh, Europe in their title. This is a French publication, Europe Action, bringing one of the first anti-Muslim, anti-Arab rhetoric in countries like France. Ils seront bientôt un million. It is referring to uh, immigrants coming from colonies. Défense de l'Occident is another example, another publication, French publication. There is this guy, Per Engdahl, writing on it. Per Engdahl and people close to this uh, review, they were actually part of an international association uh, founded in the 50s called the European Social Movement. Keep in mind, they created this in 1951 when the mainstream European integration started. They wanted to create their own version of Europe. This is another um, intellectual politician, uh, Jean Thiriard from Belgium, calling again for this pan-European space. This is a conference in Venice, 1962. Uh, Far-right leaders from all over Europe uh, uh, calling for a European party. Later, we have intellectual like Alain de Benoit, French intellectual leading the Nouvelle Droite, later influencing Dagin, a, a nationalist, pan-Eurasianist uh, uh, intellectual, influencing directly Russian generals and also today, and also alt-right people. And we have people like Salvini going to Moscow. Now, uh, Salvini used to dress always in these very stupid ways, uh, but let's leave this. Uh, so even Salvini going to Moscow, or uh, Marine Le Pen getting close to Putin, is not new. It's part of a wider story, which is running at least since 1945, ideologically prepared by some of the um, intellectual elaboration of the people movements I mentioned before. This is part of a meeting happening yesterday in Milano. Salvini invited the people, not only the people within the parties within, his, uh, within the, um, the, the, the European party group of the far right in the European parliament. He's trying to build a sort of coalition to enlarge the anti-EU groups. And this is called, the, the, the title of this co conference was towards a common sense Europe. It's not understandable to me <laughs> the meaning, but that's fine. Uh, so, I mean, these are big groups who are trying to be associated, and Linda probably will, will mention some of this, with the mainstream. And Luisa was also talking about this. So it's not just the far right. My personal perspective is that it is an overall political and cultural system who has been moving towards the right of the political spectrum. And Orban is one of the major examples of this right-wing turn of allegedly, apparently moderate people. Because one of the great scandals, and they call it scandal, in contemporary European politics is that Orban has not been, so, ex, uh, is still part of the major European party, 
the European People's Party, who is leading all the major European institutions. So people like Orban, but also other far right wing people today are within the moderate center right in Europe. Thank you very much. Thanks so much, Andrea. So, um, this disconcerting image in the back. Um, <laughs> we will move away from it. <laughs> Thank you, Brisa. So, um, Linda, I'd, I'd ask you um, to come up next. So, Linda Boss um, is a researcher in the Department of Political Communication, and her own work looks more broadly, actually, at populist movements and kind of populist modes of communication. And as Andrea was already hinting, I think one of the things that we were interested in doing tonight is thinking about, you know, the slippages and the proximities. And um, you're going to tell us a little bit about a massive transnational research yeah. project as yeah. well. So Absolutely. I'll I'll yeah. leave the floor to you. Yeah. Yeah, so, uh, yeah, also, uh, thank you very much for inviting me. I'm really uh, interested in this event. I'm also really, yeah, it's really nice to talk a bit uh, once at the Bali. I've never been here before, so <laughs> really curious to he hear your thoughts as well uh, later on. Well, as Luisa just said, I've been working on, uh, on the populist radical right for the past 15 years, and then mainly working on uh, populist political communication. I just summarize it like that. Um, and what I do is just study populism in text, actually. So there, where do we see populism in, in text, in any text? Uh, and also, how does this then affect people if we see populism in text? Uh, and today, I just want to talk a little bit about um, what is populism, where can we find it, and how can we explain the attractiveness of the populist message? And that also goes back to what Andrea has been talking about. And that can be online or offline, of course. So what I first want to start out with, what is populism? <laughs> we can talk about that for days. I always tell my students there are bookcases full on populism, so I will just give a very short <laughs> definition. And the definition is that populism is a set of ideas concerning the antagonistic relationship between the pure people on the one hand, so the good people, the imagined people, right? So the people that actually might not even exist. Uh, on the one hand, and on the other hand, the corrupt elite. So there are only two groups in society for populists, and those are the pure people on the one hand, and the corrupt and bad elite on the other hand. And of course, we see uh, today when we're talking about the radical right, and uh, I, I talk about the radical right, and we also talk about the far right and the alt right. Um, we, of course, talk about people who use this populist idea, but also connect it to other ideas, and it's usually more the nativist idea, right? So that not only the corrupt elite is the enemy of the people, but all non-native elements are as well, right? So that can be non-native people, immigrants, but also non-native cultural elements, such as the Islam, right? So, uh, that's, so that's populism. Now, what I want to argue is that if we try to unpack that a little bit and think about what really happens is what populists actually do is that they use some type of social identity framing. So they pit the in-group of the people against the out-group of the elite, the immigrants, right? And they make clear that these groups are completely different. They have irreconcilable norms, identities, interests within these groups these identities and interests are supposedly the same, right? So we all people are very similar, but the, those elites and the immigrants, they're completely different. Whereas, of course, there are similarities between these groups as well, so it doesn't make sense, but that's the frame they use. What's also very central to this frame is that this in-group of the people is a victim of the situation, uh, and these people are deprived of some something, and they're the victim of some kind of crisis that's going on, and there, that can be any crisis that populists use, actually. Um, and it's also clear, of course, that's part of the social identity frame, is that the out-group is to, is to blame for all the problems uh, of the in-group. So that's the social identity frame. So now, I hope I can use this, ha. Huh? <laughs> That was, what is populism? Then where can we find these ideas? Well, where, where can we find it? We can find it, of course, uh, within populists. So uh, populist politicians, they use these sets of ideas in their uh, ideology, in their manifestos, in the way they talk. Uh, we can also see it in more, uh, so not only politicians, uh, regular politicians, but also leaders of international populist movements like Steve Bannon, right? He uses these ideas as well. Um, we can, hey, 
<laughs> we can also find it in uh, mass media content. Um, that's what we see as well, right? So these are just two uh, examples, uh, Fox News and, uh, and The Sun. Uh, but we can see it in various uh, media coverage as well, uh, just uh, on our television and in our own newspapers online, um, online media as well. And then we can find it, of course, on social media. And this is just an example of something that you can find online, but you can find it in social media. And Trump uses a lot of populism in his tweets, but uh, other people do as well, right? So not so famous politicians, but just regular people on Twitter, but also regular people on, on live for us, such as 4chan or uh, on YouTube. So people can uh, use this idea uh, anywhere. And then the final group where we can find it is among people. So people can also have the idea that it's really true that society is ultimately just uh, actually uh, organized in two groups. And there, is, uh, one, there are two groups, the one group being the people and the other group being the elite. So people can have populist attitudes, but they can also talk in a populist way. So then the question is, how can we explain why this is so attractive to people, right? So this, this populist identity frame. Um, well, now, let's say you come across such a message, right? So someone you trust and you consider part of your group, your in-group, uh, makes clear that you, the problem you experience or the problem you fear uh, is actually not only your problem, but is actually a problem of the larger group you're part of. And it's also clear who is to blame. Now, what I would say is that it's, that is actually uh, very persuasive. Then you're actually more likely to agree that also there needs something needs to be done because it makes clear that the problem is actually not your fault, right? So you can actually escape the responsibility, still feel good about yourself, feel good about your group, and also make clear uh, that someone else is to blame. Second, you're also more likely to do something about it, to act upon it, because it's not clear, uh, it's clear that you're not alone and you're actually part of a larger politicized group that can do something about this. And there's also a severe threat to this in-group, right? We need to do something about the problem because it's clear we're together. It's also clear who is to blame. It's clear what we can do about it. So it's also clear why we should do something. And third, you should actually uh, feel uh, even more at rest if you're not only feel part of the in-group, but also feel that you're actually what we call relatively deprived. So we know that Many people voting for these populist parties actually feel that they are not getting what they sh what they deserve. They always draw the short end of the stick. It's not fair, right? They're always the one ones lacking. They feel left out. And now there's a reason for them, right? Because there's a reason for their disadvantaged position, and uh, there's a reason also to blame someone else and not actually feel responsible yourself. So these people are more likely to then also be persuaded and be mobilized by this, this uh, story, by this message. Okay, so uh, I was in a larger uh, European network and we actually uh, <laughs> decided that we, we thought this was actually how populism worked. So what did we do? Um, Hey, now you cannot see the great map. <laughs> so uh, there was a map actually in the background, <laughs> but it's gone. Um, so what did we do? We, we ran an experiment in 15 countries and we tested these uh, assumptions uh, by exposing people to different messages. And in those messages, uh, there was clear that there was a, a certain problem. Actually, we said that the purchasing power uh, would decline and it would go really bad with the economy, which is, wasn't actually really that credible because the European economy is doing quite well. Um, uh, but there was, we said that there was this organization that, 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 that said that was the case. And then uh, the organization said, okay, uh, politicians and uh, immigrants are to blame. So in one message, they didn't blame anyone and also said that it wasn't a problem of anyone. And then in other uh, cases, they said that, it, that immigrants were to blame. In other cases, politicians were to blame. In other cases, politicians and immigrants. And then we asked people, do you agree? Do you really think that there is a problem? And... Uh, would you act upon it? So would you go out, in this case, it was just signing a petition online uh, and talking to other friends about it. Would you forward this article on social media? And we found that, and that's what I thought, now you cannot see the arrow, <laughs> that that was really the case. So if you actually um, frame a story in a way in which you say that the politicians are to blame for the problems of the Dutch people uh, and for a problem that doesn't exist, then people are more likely to believe that the problem, that it's true. <laughs> um, 
And then the other picture, yeah, no, this also doesn't show, but um, we also found that the same message, so the message in which uh, indeed uh, the, the politicians were blamed for the problems of the people, um, got people more mobilized, but only those people that thought they were always losing out and always drawing the short end of the sick. Um, so we did sort of got results in line with ex expectations. What we didn't find, and that's interesting also for today, is that these messages in which immigrants were blamed for all these problems, they weren't persuasive at all. They completely backfired. So people actually uh, agreed less in that case with the message, which is interesting, but I also want to, yeah, I'm not sure how. It also isn't at that positive, of course. Um, so what I would conclude is, based on this, is that populist identity frame is attractive for certain groups in society uh, specifically. Um, and uh, the populist identity frame we now know or we think actually persuades people and mobilize them uh, because it unites them against a common enemy. And uh, the results also show the key role, actually, and that's what I wanted to talk about today, of identity and attractiveness of the populist message. So that actually means that, and the question then would be for today, for me, I think, is does this mean that the so-called populist zeitgeist, which we see in Europe right now, right, so, so many populist parties rising, the pop populist discourse being so prominent, does that mean that th that actually legitimizes identity politics? So that would be my question. Thanks so much, and we'll leave um, Homer aside, who's still better to look at than Victor Orban. But um, and I'll call our last speaker to the stage. So Mark Tutors is in the Department of Media Studies at the University of Amsterdam as well, and what he's going to talk about uh, tonight is his most recent work, as I understand, on 4chan, which is um, a space that you know, was originally identified as the space of um, anonymous and other movements, but had has, that has very much been identified with far-right and alt-right movements. So um, I will leave the floor to you and... Thank you very much. So I will try to address both the populist and the fascist frame. Um, I, I want to start with this image here. I don't know who made it, um, but it's got, it's an image of something called Pepe the Frog, who appears to be lurking in the background of some country. I don't know if anybody knows what country that I couldn't figure it out. Sweden. That's Sweden. Okay, thank you. Uh, that, okay, so, um, so he's this kind of, uni it, to me, using, uh, uh, I'm, I'm not an expert in, in visual iconographic analysis, but it seems like a kind of, re to represent a sort of a, gl a unified global threat to the nation state that's kind of emerging from the underground. Um, and uh, so I want to um, talk about, so I'm gonna get into this Pepe the Frog thing, and I'm talking about something called Kekistan. Um, but I would like to suggest that this, this idea here as represented in this image, is actually kind of ironical in two senses. Um, it's ironical in one sense because the the image of this frog that underlies this 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 uh, this Sweden here is not su supposed to be sincere. It's not supposed to be a, an expression of sincerity. Um, it's ironic in a second sense because it, uh, in this case, is being used to represent this kind of pan-national, pan-European uh, movement which actually, when we get into it, is actually anti-globalization. So it's ironical in that sense as well. Um, so why this image of Pepe the Frog? Because I assume that this image is supposed to represent the new right or the alt-right in this case. And um, I'll discuss then uh, the overlap between these, uh, the, this image and the alt-right. Um, and I'll use this example, as I say, of Kekistan to explain how fans of this image of Pepe the Frog engage with ideas from the New Right, specifically the French Nouvelle Droite. Um, so to do so, I'll begin by introducing you to 4chan, the anonymous forum, web forum, where 
Pepe is frequently used, and I can use this device. OK. So this uh, image here, uh, one of my colleagues found this on uh, a subreddit called Meme Economy. Um, and it corresponds with, I'm not sure how well you can read it, but at the top you have 4chan, which is sort of envisioned as the source of all memes. And then it kind of filters down eventually into the mainstream, so that from the fringe to the mainstream. And this kind of corresponds with 4chan's long-held self-imaginary. Um, we can think of 4chan as kind of like the bottom half of the web. Um, and I have an image for that as well. Um, so the, this also includes, this bottom half of the web, in addition to including 4chan, includes other um, message boards, but it also includes like the comment sections of all social media as well. So like the comment section of YouTube, for example, perhaps newspapers as well. And uh, the, there, uh, I would like to sort of present this to you as a kind of a, there's a subculture that exists in these spaces. And this subculture has a long history. Um, and they, we refer, me and, and, and my colleagues with whom I work on this topic, we refer to these as the denizens of the deep vernacular web. Um, and they see themselves as having a, a sort of a long history. Uh, and that history, in fact, uh, predates in some sense social media, and also, in fact, could even be seen as predating the web itself. And they see themselves, and I have a slide for that as well. And so having this long history that predates social media and predates the web, they, in a way, in a way see themselves as having been, like, as the digital natives of the web who feel that they've been colonized by the, uh, the, the global forces of social media that have sort of shunted them off to the periphery, to the fringe, to a sort of a reserve. And so hence, due to this feeling, they kind of resonate with this idea, which was addressed before from the Nouvelle Droite, this rhetoric of remplacement or the great replacement. So this is the idea that, uh, that, has, that was developed, as we heard earlier, by French intellectuals uh, of, the, of the New Right, that indigenous European culture is, is being replaced by the forces of neoliberalism and the forces of globalization. A lot of concepts from, that we typically associate with the left get reused uh, and developed in a different way in this, rhetoric, in this discourse. So what this discourse does is that it kind of reformulates and intellectualizes old far-right ideas that we would associate with racism in the sense of biological racism. Um, and it does so along culturalist lines. Sometimes it's referred to as differentialist, um, differentialist racism. Um, and what they do, interestingly and confusingly, is they kind of <clears throat> advocate xenophobia, but they do so in the name of actually xenophilia. Uh, and if you don't understand that, you won't be able to really engage with them. Uh, and so they actually they, they advocate a discourse of cultural preservationism, of local preserving local identities from homogenization by the forces of American neoliberal globalization and multiculturalism, which is connected to that in, in their minds. And this has been referred to, actually, uh, by historians of fascism as a kind of a metapoliticization of original fascist ideas that are kind of dressed up and recycled. Um, so, uh, and that notion of referring to this as the metapoli metapoliticization of fascism is actually um, a reference to how the Nouvelle Droite, in fact, have used leftist ideas, have used the ideas of Antonio Gramsci to sort of propagate a culture war. Ah, water. I don't have your magic pills, Louisa. Louisa has magic pills so that she doesn't get a dry throat. I just learned that earlier. OK. So and now I'm going to talk about Kekistan. Kekistan is the deep vernacular web's vernacular take on the nouvelle droite ideas that I just explained a moment ago. So uh, as Louisa said, the, uh, 4chan was once associated with progressive activism with Anonymous. Um, but in, let's say, roughly around 2014, maybe a bit earlier, uh, it took a kind of a reactionary turn. And some may say that arguably, actually, it was always kind of reactionary, or at the very least, extremely nihilistic. 
And um, this is a picture of people who are participating in this meme of Kekistan that emerged from 4chan and then kind of spread through Twitter and YouTube um, and became a kind of what I have called before like LARP protesting, where people do live action role playing of with tropes that come out of internet subculture to um, antagonize people who are protesting Trump and so forth. And so here they are in, uh, in, a, in New York. Um, in their regalia. And um, this all sounds quite sort of American-centric, in a sense it is. However, Weperos Tegenlich thought it was relevant enough to make a documentary about this particular meme, actually, last year, that they called Trollen, Trump, and Thierry. Uh, and it, this documentary, which was all about Kekistan, um, uh, was accused by certain uh, intellectual figures uh, as being kind of a uh, insufficiently critical and actually basically kind of uh, unaware of the fact that this concept is, in, is, is engages with the Nouvelle Droite's concept of metapolitics. And I actually spoke at the meetup for this documentary and was, told, was informed by people who apparently knew that there were, in fact, in the audience, self-identified fascists um, uh, on that particular evening. Um, but many, if not most, see themselves, uh, I would argue, who, that are associated with this Kekistan meme um, as not uh, particularly fascist or not even necessarily even conservative. They see themselves as just what they would call shit posters. So what is that? What is a shit poster? So the idea, the meme of Kekistan, and you can see this when you watch the documentary, I think that the filmmaker did achieve that. Um, it's, the, it's, to, it's intended to sort of mock those who mistakenly view all of the issues that, that uh, national populists uh, promote as fascist. So people who say Trump is a fascist. So there, this is intended to mock people who say that. And uh, that is why there's, this is their flag. This is intended to antagonize. So uh, de Jong's film tries to make sense of why it is that her little brother or her little cousin, who's one of the main characters in the film, plays with this image and other images like this. Um, and his claim, her younger cousin, is that this taboo is meaningless to him and his generation. He's 15 years old, and you're not going to tell him as an adult you know, how the world works because he is not going to listen to you. That's ridiculous. I mean, he's, he's 15. He knows. So he finds it hilarious how much this upsets people. But of course, he fails to realize um, how, in fact, it... Uh, all other points that one may make aside, how in fact it does also play into an agenda of actual fascists. And this, um, so, so this kind of 4chan style taboo breaking humor that he is identifying with and he tried to explain in this, uh, in this event and through this, this the, the filmmaker tried to explain, um, this actually created for a while around the time of the US election, this unstable coalition of these various elements that were referred to as the alt-right. At a certain point, it was broken up into the alt-right and the alt-light. But already <clears throat> before this Charlottesville event, which you may remember from August of 2017, the Unite the Right rally, already before that, this, whole, this coalition was coming apart because it was not really stable. OK, so. <clears throat> Um, the question then to sort of wrap up and on this is, is, the, is this dangerous, this thing that we're talking about here? Is this a dangerous space of the, of the right, of the European far right? I would say yes, uh, in that it's been tied to, to violence. It's been tied to deadly violence in the case of uh, Christchurch, and that wasn't the first time, but that was certainly the most dramatic instance. Um, but I would also say that it's not the source. Um, this replacement rhetoric has actually been promoted by national populists for many years. And in fact, a figure who currently has quite a few seats in the, in the Senate here uh, uh, ex expressly articulated this concept when he spoke of um, homeopathic watering down, homeopathic 
Verdunning. So that's, that is one instance where we can find that in the discourse in the current established political parties in this particular country. So um, racist interpretations of the, this kind of replacement idea should be totally intolerate, intoler, intolerable in European society. That sort of goes without question, I think. And uh, I'm very happy to debate. And I, I guess this isn't going to be one of those uh, situations where we're going to have figures who want to debate that. But if there were people who wanted to debate that, that would be welcome. However, I also want to make the point, because I do kind of get the vibe that we're sort of all on the same, all on the same thing here. Maybe not. Uh, I want to make the point that uh, nationalist, populist xenophobia is not equivalent to old-fashioned Nazi biological racism. And when people think that it is, they make a mistake in doing so. Um, it's legitimate. You may not like it. But it is legitimate for members of a nation state to question how it is that immigration is going to fold, unfold. Unlike climate change, there isn't a consensus on that issue, right? Now, I personally come from Canada. My father was a refugee. I come from a country where there, at least a city, where there was no sort of majority population for as long as I've ever been alive. But that's not the case in, these, in this country and in many other countries. And so these are, these are active issues, and they can't that that's that's that those are those are debates that happen what must be avoided is the conspiratorial narrative as baudet seemingly advocates um, <clears throat> that uh, so so while certain kind of demographic projections that you can encounter within these spaces may have some kind of validity um, many national populists dramatically exaggerate and mischaracterize this issue and furthermore i would like to address, go specifically to that point of Evola, actually, that um, they, for example, Baudet specifically brought up the concept of Boreal, which I believe is a reference to Hyperborean, which I believe is a concept that comes from Evola. And that's basically textbook esoteric fascism in my books. OK, so uh, I, I, I'm done, but I was asked to speak about a technical perspective on this, which I don't know that you want to hear or have time for. So that's how it looks. That's how 4chan looks. That's an hour of 4chan. Basically, the, 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 the meaning of this image is that it's extremely ephemeral, and that the red lines, re, uh, the, the, the red lines represent large amounts of text. The blue le lines represent small amounts of text. No matter how popular your text is, it eventually gets pushed down and disappears from the website. And it is also anonymous. And what that means is, is that it's very different than the kinds of places that you go to online. Because it's anonymous, you can't carry your reputational capital with you. You can't prove who you are. Nobody knows who you are. You're just another schmo. And so the way that you show that you are actually, that you belong to this space is by your clever and up-to-date use of memes. And that's why 4chan is the home of memes. The other thing that I've, we've noticed in looking at this space is that because it's so ephemeral, there is something that they do in order to keep the conversation going because it literally mitigates against a conversation going on. They have to create something which I can't get into called a general thread, which is basically a curated compilation of the conversation so far. And what we noticed is that that particular technical affordance in combination with the weird subcultural aspects of this place, does lead to, at least in certain cases, the what we've called the accumulation of bullshit. So basically, people make nonsense and conspiracy theories out of this environment. They kind of collect it, put it together, and they work together to create these crazy nonsense things. And so this is a visualization of how it is that that bullshit spreads. Start, this is in the case of, you could do this with perhaps other conspiracies. This is a conspiracy called QAnon, which I'm not going to get into. It's very weird. And basically, you can, at the bottom is 4chan, and then it moves up through Reddit, YouTube, Facebook, and then into the mainstream media. And uh, this particular conspiracy, as with the Pizzagate conspiracy and others, started in this deep vernacular web. And 
then kind of we can see how it traveled from the fringe to the mainstream. So it is, I guess, my, my point in showing those last images is that this is very marginal stuff, um, but it does have a sort of certain impact on the mainstream. And at the very least, you could say that it sets a kind of, it creates a new sort of style for, um, that's what subcultures do, right? And in this particular moment in time, it's a kind of a, it's very much a right wing kind of a style. Thank you very much. I will actually, you know, we were going to have a round of responses, but looking also at the time and wanting to hear from you, um, I will um, ask everybody to come back up on stage and I will drug one of the presenters as well. He's just referring to some magic Viennese throat pills. Um, I think, I don't know, maybe we want to actually leave this image up here because I think, you know, the two kind of important points that, you know, all of you kept reiterating was, you know, yes, it is marginal, but yes, we need to be very attentive to the passage, to the slippage. And at the same time, I'd like to pick up another thing that you said, which was about taking these forms of resentment, if that's what we want to call it, um, seriously without you know, kind of deriding it as just bullshit and as just something that is marginal. You know, I'll just leave those comments there because I'm sure you all have questions. So what we will do is let me gather maybe three questions to start with and then we will let our panelists respond. So who would like to start? Is there, is there another mic on the floor or shall I give this one out? Okay. souls who would like to start with a question? Yes. Already, Already yes. <laughs> question for Mark. Um, so it seems to me that the alt-right is not the same as fascism, although there are some overlaps, sometimes maybe not intentional. So I want to push a bit the subculture line of inquiry and kind of compare it to when I was growing up in 90s in Poland and everyone was a Satanist, to like a piece of the church. And the level of moral panic in the political discourse was absolutely intense, which just made all of us, you know, provoke people even more about how we love burning cats and all of those <laughs> stuff. <laughs> but my point is that um, obviously there was not active level of engagement um, in the political scene or even with trying to actively organize against the church or against the state. So I guess from your research, how do you distinguish um, which of those are just Satanists playing around and which of those actually are potentially capable of being engaged then in more serious fascist political projects? Is there a way to determine that at all so we can determine how to engage with them? I mean, so, as I remember, yeah, oh, wait, three questions, got it. Let me gather a and I think this question of, you know, I mean, what actually of this and what you are mentioning translates into, you know, kind of real political potential, right, and, and action. Um, so I'll give you and then we'll pass it on to you. My question would be about anti-Semitism. Um, I attended a presentation the other week um, also on the alt-right on a website called Red Meat. Really a nice website. And um, <laughs> so there the anti-Semitism was outspoken. So there were images of Marx and Adorno um, sort of with blown up faces, mm -hmm. uh, highlighting anti-Semitic mm -hmm. stereotypes. But Wilders, for instance, for a long time, I don't know what his status nowadays is in that respect, uh, was pro-Israel, had a, a past in the kibbutz, if I'm not mistaken, mm -hmm. and of course also highlighted this sort of the, the Holocaust as a historical lesson for Europe. So how do you mm -hmm. see that? Okay. And if, you can just, if we can do a kind of human chain to pass on the <laughs> microphone. Uh, I have a question which might be a bit of off topic, but I'm just curious about whether you know any one of uh, three of you about invocation of nature in sort of like pristine nature or wilderness in the contemporary post-fascist or fascist mm -hmm. thinking. And also like related, for example, to this Evola's idea of Hyperborean <laughs> myth, which you in the last presentation talked about, like whether you can elaborate a bit on this aspect of eco-fascism, so to speak. 
Great. So I will leave the speakers the floor now. I don't know who wants to jump in first. I mean, Mark, you started answering, so if okay. you want to jump uh, in. I just, somebody sent me a link to a conference in uh, Sweden on the far right and environmentalism, and I thought that would be a very interesting paper to present on this concept of ecofascism, because that guy, uh, that Christchurch guy, claims to have been an ecofascist, and uh, I guess it's that's an area that people are interested in. So I would like to hear your thoughts on that maybe afterwards, but um, the, the Hyperborean thing I'm going to leave to you, because I assume that you know that Ebola better than me. I would also like to ask you, actually, what the relationship between esotericism is and fascism, and if that's because there is, we have like a, we have the only, in, in, in our university, we have like the only um, Western esotericism graduate program. And I think they consider him like a legitimate esoteric figure. And I, and, I, and um, but I'm not, I can't say that because they're not here, so I. Um, but the, uh, I, I can't really answer the question too, too much more, the, na the nature one. The, uh, the thing about, there is a, okay, the um, anti-Semitism thing, there's, tons of anti-Semitism on 4chan. It's like just the standard operating procedure of just how you, when my research has been, they found our research and they called me, you know, Jew and a fag and everything. And uh, uh, they also use this, they have this meme that I actually just finished writing a paper, I'm, I'm revising a paper on, that's like the triple echo brackets meme. I don't know if you know about that, but that's like this kind of, it started off as this anti-Semitic meme and it became a kind of a, a nebulous populist sort of us them thing where what we found was that inside of these three brackets, the most typical thing that they would use in that the word in there, it's a very interesting sign because you can see the contents of it for semioticians. Um, and so the most common uh, re referent was they or them and or and then after that the media <laughs> so uh it, it was just like this kind of anti-semitism becomes this kind of like vehicle for this kind of generic nebulous populism is what i noticed and as far as the uh the uh thing about uh satanism in the in the sort of 90s um i mean didn't didn't they sort of burn down some churches and stuff like that in norway and stuff like that <laughs> yeah yeah um, yeah. Well, I also think that it's the exception, too, when it comes to this culture. You know, I mean, I think that that guy, that, that Christchurch thing, that was like my worst nightmare when I first started re researching this stuff, and, and it came true, and, and that totally confirms everything. But so I can't say that it's not, I can't say anymore that it's like, you know, a bunch of people who, some of, where, where there's a very small element of dangerous because of what happened. But I do still think that <clears throat> they mostly think of themselves as, as sort of uh, taking the piss. And, and how to be able to distinguish between them is like an enormous technical challenge for us in our field. Because, you know, we have, and, and there are ways that you can kind of do that technically, like where you can find these general threads. Because normally they, you see it anonymous, that is, or at least the message board, because it's anonymous, is treated as a blob. This is all just one blob, but actually we can kind of distinguish little communities within there. So I guess that there are some more extreme communities within the sort of overarching blob. But how that then relates to sort of, you know, uh, actual issues that are of concern to people who deal with hate speech. Uh, one thing I did realize is that it's not so much, yeah, it's, it's more like extreme speech than hate speech. Anyway, I've spoken enough. Linda, do you want to jump yeah, in, kind well, of thinking about, you know, also not the extremes, but... Yeah, yeah. Well, I wonder about the anti-Semitism part, maybe, because um, I, indeed, Wilders is very pro, uh, pro-Israel, but I think there are a lot of differences between the populist right in Europe and in their, also, in, in what they emphasize as their enemies, and some of them are very anti-Islam and others are less, so I think the emphasis is different and also depends upon the context. Uh, uh, Baudet or his followers do seem to use some of these uh, anti-Semitic uh, memes, but I'm not sure, also not sure how serious that indeed is or whether that's just a way of speaking or just a joke or it's, it's not, it's, that's really not clear, but it, it, it seems scary. And, but is it scary? We, we don't know. <laughs> we have no idea. 
And I think the question of what is scary kind of goes back to, you know, kind of your point of, okay, when does this become politically, yeah. like, how does how is it activated? I mean, how does yeah. it actually turn people out to go vote or yeah. to go out on the streets um, yeah. or to, you know, to take very violent actions? For me, the difference would be, for me also, I think and we didn't talk about it that much here now, but uh, the, the role the mainstream media play is still very large, I know, mm -hmm. as a political communication scholar. So um, from also, for instance, the demonstration you, you started out with, right? What we know is that the mainstream media, they play em emphasis on this group of 1,000 uh, people standing there where the 6,000 are actually not even mentioned in the, in the newspaper article or, or, or on the broadcast news. So, and... Uh, so I wonder, I think it, it depends on how this topic of anti-Semitism then also travels uh, broader in mainstream media and whether it's used by followers of Baudet or by the Forum or uh, by members of the party. Uh, I think what's, of course, the, the, the difficulty for him is that he has a whole party around him, right, with all kind of members and that you don't know what they will do. And Wilders has much more control of his party and his, his party line is much clearer, therefore. And I think this question of magnification, even by media outlets that do not support these yeah. groups, but that yeah, yeah, certainly yeah, yeah, yeah. give it, you know, uh -huh. as you're saying, I mean, there's this, you know, really magnification multiplication effect and yeah. spectacularization, very much so. Yeah. Yeah. Andrea. Uh, well, a couple of On random. nature, historical perspective. <laughs> well, first of all, I would like to start saying that uh, even in Italy, we don't burn churches. So it's not just Eastern <laughs> Europe. And this will never happen in my country, considering that the Vatican is there. So it's Yeah, exactly. So, you know, like we are safe. <laughs> uh, no, being serious. Uh, uh, Anti Semitism is, is an interesting issue, I think, today. Uh, and I, I'm not even sure, as they were saying, probably how much is real anti-Semitism, how much is simply anti-Soros today. Because what I'm seeing, for example, in countries like Italy, since uh, Orban started criticizing Soros because he's funding the, uh, the you know, immigration and, and he wants a pro-immigrant or an immigrant, for a, a Europe full of immigrants, I'm seeing that Italian far-right parties are, uh, have started criticizing Soros continuously. And this was not happening like six, seven, eight, maybe one year ago, at least not to this stage. Because you know, when, let's say, uh, there has been anti-Semitic attack across Europe, in France, uh, when Jean-Marie Le Pen was on the rise, and so on, even recently, but you know, what more structured party have been able to do was to play down anti-Semitism because it was not paying electorally. So immigrants, black people, black faces, and so were uh, an easy target. While you know, if were, you were using anti-Semitism, you were not gaining votes. Maybe today is changing because the world has been reshaped. <laughs> so we, we we don't really know what, what what's is happening. But certainly, there is now even in Italy this Soros, but. I'm not 100% sure it is anti-Semitism because he's coming from the Jewish community or because he's uh, funding the enemies of the far right. There you go. I mean, you just said that populism, elite, they are against the elite mm -hmm. groups. And therefore, there's a the, there's the connection to Judaism. Yes, but it's, 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 I'm 100 uh, percent. I 100 percent agree with you. But there is a paradox, which you know, sometimes the, some of these populist leaders, especially when associated to the mainstream right, like for example in Britain, they are super elite, mm -hmm. but are still able to say that we are against the elite. So you know, there is a confusion <laughs> yeah. as well in people mm -hmm. voting for yeah. them. And, and now uh, about nature and so on. Well, to be honest, I understand only. 50% of what Evola writes, <laughs> so, so it's very it's very complex, and 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 I don't think that all people reading him, the followers, <laughs> do understand what Evola writes. Uh, what I can say is that in, in terms of eco-fascism, I mean it was existing in the interwar years as well. I mean, and it's not even a surprise in some ways, because I mean if you look at people, even people like Evola who were not so interested probably 100% in nature and so on, they were calling for a pre-modern world. So this idea of Hobbit, 
later borrowed by some of the new right people. So certainly, you know, a world with without the ruins. I mean, because they were actually walking across the ruins of modernization, this world that was different, and so on. Uh, in terms of Evola, esotericism, and so on, I think that, you know, that, at least in my view, in countries like Italy and, and maybe even France, I think that that was the side less appealing to some neo-fascists, in a sense that uh, they were much more interested in Evola's challenge to the modern world. They were very interested in this uh, aesthetic idea of Evola, saying, you know, like, we need pu pure people, and you are the best, you are the warriors, you are the soldiers, which in Italy, at least, I can't say in other countries because I have no expertise, in Italy, this ended up with people becoming terrorists. Well, there is all, never this direct link be, between almost, almost never, Evola and then. But I was reading, for example, some of the uh, people um, influenced by Evola in the uh, 50s, young people belonging to the neo Italian neo-fascist party. I mean, they were writing something against democracy, which was terrible. You know, I read some of their, 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 their uh, journals, you know, very strange journals. They were simply challenging democracy completely. You know, post-fascist, post-war democracy they were saying this is not the, the political system. And if you if you if you keep as then also the Nouvelle Droite did, some of Evola's idea up to you know the most extreme extent, you may end up challenging democracy and society, even you know, as a terrorist. And that's the problem with people like Evola and others, because you can use their words in many different ways, as you were rightly showing with the, with the Nouvelle Droite. Because if you say that I'm for differentialism, as you were rightly saying, you can, be, you, you can say, well, I'm anti-global. I'm on the left. I'm against <laughs> this. But it might also translate in, I'm white, you are black, you <laughs> live there, and I live here, and you know, full stop. Thank you for that. Let's let's take a couple more questions. Do you want to pass it on? Hi. Um, I'm interested to know how much you personally engage with the far right in discourse, either online or in person. So, for example, you observe 4chan. Do you actually engage with them, or do you just observe? Um, and so, also the other people. Mm. Thank you for that. And if you can pass it on, you've got your neighbor close to you. Yeah, maybe to add to that point, like, um, do you think that there is, maybe moving away from the fringe, that there is any possibility of a, a dialogue, that there are some points that we, as, as maybe as the left, should take seriously, that we might be missing? Or is there no dialogue possible at all? Thank you for that. And we'll take one more here on the... I'll, thanks. Yeah, I would actually like to connect my question to yours because I'm, I also have this struggle personally because I'm working, I'm researching the criminalization of migration and I have seen through practice and through theory how this discourse actually impacts our law and practices and everything. So. Um, my question would be also, yeah, so to what extent to, we should listen to that? Because obviously keeping it marginalized isn't working. It's going to emerge at some point precisely because it is marginalized. And um, so, yeah, to connect with this question is also a very <laughs> generic question, how to fight this, <laughs> of course, and what to do. Thanks for that, and I think the three questions connect nicely yeah. together. Um, you know, but both how to counter it and how, you know how to how to understand these spaces. Linda, do you yeah, want to start yeah, this yeah. time? Shall I start? Yeah. Um, well, do I engage with these people? Well, I think I, I I do, but just on a personal basis because I know people who vote for these parties, right? So, especially these more mainstream. I, I wouldn't call them mainstream, but in in light of this evening, they're called mainstream, maybe. But I would call them the populist radical right. Yeah, these these people are are everywhere. So I do engage with them, but I, do I have discussions with them? No, it's because it. Yeah, I try to, but it's very difficult, right? Um, 
What I do, yeah, also what you, what you ended up saying also, these, these people also have legitimate issues and legitimate uh, worries, and that's what was also why I wanted to keep my presentations a bit, presentation, yeah, a bit objective or neutral, and just say, okay, so these populist claims are an answer to some people, people's problems, and they really feel that someone listens to them right now, and I think we should really take that seriously, and... Um, I don't have, unfortunately, I don't have an answer to it and to uh, the answer of, um, of the left and uh, how we should uh, get these people back. But um, I, I do think they, these people have real issues and they have real worries and they're really afraid of uh, all kinds of different changes uh, in society and uh, of what they will lose even, because before we used to think that these were people that were lower educated, only white men and uh, people that with low income, low socioeconomic status, and uh, we actually know from uh, the last election here in the Netherlands that for about that, there were a lot of uh, higher educated people. Um, and some research showed shows that these people also might be um, actually afraid to lose their privileged position. So it's not generally the people that have a lower position that they're afraid they, they will drop even more, right? It's also people that have a, have a higher position. So I think, um, I'm not sure whether that answers the question, <laughs> but um, yeah, I think we should really take these people seriously and also still uh, talk to them, also not stigmatize them because uh, one of my colleagues is actually working more on how political parties react to the populist parties. And uh, there we see that marginalization is actually not working because we see that if we isolate and imitate these parties, because that's actually what a lot of more mainstream, mainstream, mainstream right parties do, uh, then, then these parties only grow. So it's, it's really uh, important to really think about, also talk to them, take them seriously, not stigmatize them, not isolate them so it's a, but engage in discussions and try to really uh, have have good discussions with them and try to overrule them in a way but it's difficult because yeah we know that if if people have a strong opinion especially an extreme opinion on something and if you give them various viewpoints their opinion will become only more extreme that's what we know as well so it's it's really difficult no, thank you for that. And also, I think it's, it's really important. One of the reasons we wanted to focus on imaginations, on strategies of communication, on symbols, is that a lot of the discussion of populist voters you know, has become very either economistic, as you're saying, or cultural, as saying, you know, the classic populist voter, right? Which is very, very problematic and, in mm -hmm. fact, has, I think, even driven, you know, populist politics further. So, mm -hmm. yeah. Mark. Um, uh, <clears throat> the, the first question about engaging with them, I I prefer would prefer not to, um, because uh, but uh, when it does when it does occur, it's it's like the, I'm the, uh, we are engaged with, and then it's like because of the particular like level of discourse in these places, it's rather sort of um, it's yeah it's just sort of name calling and stuff. Um, I have been in situations where I have. I, I, well, there was that take on the meetup thing where, which we talked about earlier, <laughs> and then so I, I had to, that in that situation I engaged with people. But I mean, in relation to the two subsequent questions, which relate back to that first question, I do think that um, yeah, uh, you you can't frame. Unfortunately, these things just in, like as the left would tend to do in strictly economic terms. It's just not really a reflection of the reality of things. People have cultural grievances that are, can't be explained through economic terms. And that's how we would like to look at it on the left. And um, those are very difficult discussions. And I, I like the fact, I'm not, not from the Netherlands, I like the fact that in the Netherlands, you know, the, the Bali, you know, they try to put, I was here for an event and they had uh, Links and Hein style together on stage there. And some people walked out, but they weren't like, it wasn't like booed. Uh, and if that, and you couldn't do that where I come from, and I, I, I appreciate that. Um, I, it, when you try to do something like that in North America, it's just a shit show. It's just, it's just there's no point in trying to do it, actually. It's just a disaster. Um, I don't know that that's actually the way that you're going to uh, resolve things, but at least it's, it's a nice, this is a great institution, and I appreciate the, these kinds of uh, these kinds of attempts to, to talk things through sort of civilly. 
But these are ex enormously complicated issues, you know, that we can't uh, resolve. And there are legitimate points that are in, you know, this thing, the demographic thing that they talk about. I mean, there's, that is the case, right? Like, there will be this demographic displacement in this country, so, so to speak. Uh, but in my country, it's been like that for ages, and, and, and everything's fine. Um, but, but, you know, if you deny that and somehow don't allow for that as a possibility, that's, then you just, you know, you're just creating a conspiracy, basically. Uh, so. And I think that's the, you know, kind of that's the difficult thing. Is that, okay, how do you have a discussion without in a sense, acknowledging some of these very problematic assumptions relating to demography, for example. I mean, that, you know, so without kind of slipping into that. Um, but also, as I think both of you were, were saying, you know, kind of also moving away from the assumption that there is such a thing as the far right supporter voter. And we tend to think of it still in very kind of stereotypical terms and very mm -hmm. much in the extremes where, you know, that certainly wouldn't be sufficient to put the current center right parties in power. Andrea, do you want to add uh, your voice to well, this? Well, I mean, considering that I, from time to time, I write for media, I, I don't engage with them, they, they engage with me. <laughs> yeah. So, uh, for, I mean, likely my mother doesn't speak English, so she cannot read my, <laughs> some of the comments after the articles. I have to say that I agree with them. It's very hard to talk with these people, and I don't usually reply. I never reply. I receive email. I received a letter once, um, which always you know, let me think why these people have all this time to write me. Uh, but uh, I, don't usually, I don't usually tackle them directly. I think that it's much more useful to come or to be in events like this one or talking to a wider public because, I mean, uh, I agree uh, as well that you know, there is no this, the stereotype of the far-right militants, black shirts, shaved, and so on. There are lots of people who vote for them for protests out of protest because they have problems, and so on. So there should be ways to try to convince them. Probably this is, we live in a very strange world full of fake news. There has been a challenge, as we know, to culture and to education. And these are also some of the outcomes of what is happening today, because there are people voting out of any logic, so against their own interests sometimes. So probably in maybe 10 years, there will be more solution. I engaged some of these people only a couple of times, I have to say. Once after I wrote an article for the Washington Post on Italy, a girl later I found out that she was one of the major fake news generator in Italy. And she writes for the Casa Pound but Casa Pound is, is the fascist movement she was showing at the beginning. And, you know, like I wrote this article on uh, fascism in the context of the Italian election March last year. And she immediately wrote me. And I was surprised because in the past, Italians usually were not replying to, to my articles in English. They were just insulting to the articles in Italian. <laughs> uh, while she, she was very kind to write me, immediately challenging me and saying, well, you talk about fascism, but you know, this is nothing and so on. Uh, why you don't talk about Muslims, what they are doing in Europe? And so I spent two hours challenging her all the time. So she was asking about Muslims, look at Muslim in Belgium, in the cities, in the Netherlands, and so on. And all the time I was asking only one question, which was, what do you think about Benito Mussolini and fascism in Italy? Do you agree with them or not? She was never answering up to the point that she answered. And she said, yes, I'm a little Balilla. Balilla was the young fascist uh, kid so I think that you know, in some ways, you, we need to keep fighting because uh, they need to admit that. But the problem is not just if they admit; is that today, you know, we should go back to the meaning of words because sometimes racism is not called racism anymore, and also fascism is not called fascism anymore. So there are many ways, but I think that is extremely problematic to find a solution. Certainly not today. 
And I think on this point of kind of reclaiming the meaning of words, but also of ideas. I mean, and you talked about, you know, ways in which kind of metapolitical ideas, Gramscian ideas have been picked up. I mean, and this is, you know, has a long genealogy, as you noted, from De Benoit on. But also other, you know, um, things that we would very much identify with the left, with the autonomous left, whether, you know, kind of opposition to the forces of globalization, but also tactic strategies. Um, and I think that's really important to kind of, yes. If I can just add Absolutely. something. Uh, because maybe it's to answer to your question about you know, what to use and how to, to deal. We re I think that we, today we really need to pay lots of attention in, because the risk is legitimizing some of these ideas. And there is already enough too much legitimization of this. When we all mention Orban, we shouldn't forget that Orban is de facto leading part of the institutions in Europe. So there is already a legitimization, a stigmatization of migrants and so on. And as he was rightly saying, these are sometimes emergencies. These are sometimes, there are problems of integration. And we need to be able to talk about this openly, but not in the way that we should try to use such themes as they do, because otherwise we legitimize. And in my view, you know, the, de the deb debate are very right wing today. Which again goes to the kind of the spillage far beyond, you know, I think these limited, you know, communities, which will become almost, you know, kind of folkloric in the way we talk about them. Other questions? We have time for a few more. Um, where is the mic? Who's got the mic? So can you pass it <laughs> on to your to colleague on the aisle <laughs> and then here in front? Thank you. Hi, hello. Um, I have a question about the right wing and religion. Um, so historically, it was uh, the whole religious discourse was present already in the, in the fascist movement as well. It was more of a paganism. Today, we see, on the one hand, criticism of Islam and religiosity in general, the practice of religiosity, but at the same time, uh, Christianity and the church are seen as the defenders of traditional values, values which are, again, considered to be challenged by globalization. So I wonder what your thoughts about it. Okay. You can pass it back to the colleague on the aisle. Yeah, I just kind of wanted to go off the, the slogan that we have uh, kind of titling this event is Democracy Needs Imagination. And the, the kind of responses coming from you uh, is saying that, well, we don't have answers to these things or it's very complicated to solve these, <laughs> <laughs> these issues. And that, that's you know, interesting to me. And, and I'd like to kind of uh, probe that a little bit more and see, especially, Linda, of what you say about how we, we need to really not stigmatize and engage with the similar kind of processes of, of us and them groups of, of really blaming you know, you know, uh, far right voters uh, and really engaging with the very real and material ways in which they feel threatened or insecure, you know. Mm -hmm. So I, I wonder what any of your thoughts are with how actually these statements do offer imaginative kind of uh, catalyzing forces for progress and, and good and I guess more liberal thinking. Thank you, and let's take one more. So if you can pass it on to the back there. Hello. Um, could you maybe comment on the current and recent revelations uh, regarding the identitarian movement and their connection to, for example, Christchurch? Because when it comes to spaces of the old right in Europe, they, on the one hand, occupied uh, traditional left means of demonstrations um, in public spaces. On the other hand, professionalized um, online marketing for right-wing uh, movements or professionalize their use of fortune and other platforms. Thanks. No, and thanks for that, because I think that's a very important thing to note. And some of you who've been following the news will know that um, uh, the Christchurch murder and, and following Arden's example, I refuse to say his name, which I think she very rightly decided not to, received, or actually, sorry, gave a donation to uh, an Austrian identitarian movement. And so now there's ongoing discussions in Austria about the links between this man, Selner, and the current governing coalition. So there's all kinds of interesting connections. But I will let um, you guys respond. Andrea, do you want to start first? Yeah. I mean, religion is <laughs> like, uh, I recently wrote something about that. I mean, the problem is that in this broad church of the far right, you have people like Evola, 
who were disinterested in religion, where they were challenging the type of you know, religion, classic, Catholic, and so on. I think that today, uh, the links between the far right, people like Salvini, for example, who went to this World Congress, are very pragmatic. I don't think that Salvini or others are very interested in religion themselves. Is They are exploiting Catholic religion in Europe because it's very easy to use today the Catholic religion because you can identify Catholicism with Europe and with traditional values. It's very easy because in this way you are against Islam, you are against Islamic cultures, you are against uh, homosexuals, you are against non-traditional families, you are against everything which is evolving in a way, is modern. Mm -hmm. So it's much better to go back to some ultra-Catholic uh, fringes because they are the obit world. Mm -hmm. So for people like Salvini and others, it's very easy to say and very useful to say we are with them. Then they are divorced. They have kids from three women, maybe. But that's not a problem. <laughs> because they say, OK, but you know, I don't, I, I'm not a religious guy, 100%. But I go around and I show my Christian Catholic symbols because you know that is the society that we want. But I think that it because there is this specific link. I don't think that they are, they really believe in religion. There are only a minority of movements that specifically are ultra Catholic and far right, like Forza Nuova in Italy. But they, you know, some of them, they, ban they, they, they don't want that their activists, I don't know, drink too much alcohol or do some of, some of these things. So I think that the majority of them is a very good way. The problem is always the legitimization, because if today, when Europe was culturally prepared in many ways to challenge fascism, up to the 80s, roughly, when antifascism was a value, today antifascism is not a value anymore, well, the Catholic Church sometimes was trying to play lots of attention in the association with this group. Today, you have a fight within the Catholic Church against Francis, Pope Francis. So you have people like Bjork and others funding Bannon to create that incredible, stupid, in many ways, uh, school for populists in the monastery. But that is a legitimization, because it is exactly some of the things that we were talking before. What is the borderline between conservative and uh, the far right in that case? You have cardinals involved with that, um, with that enterprise. So for this reason, answers are very different, are very difficult today. Because one of the problems is that today we are at a low of the public debate where if you go, if you are a politician, you go out and you talk about, I want uh, migrants coming to my country, you are immediately attacked and you don't gain votes. In my personal view, and this is very unpopular, there should be political answers from political institutions, from structured parties, but real policies. Once which is not very popular, I proposed to some Italian political parties to run in the European election, saying we want to build a welfare state for all Europeans, funded by the European Union, not taking care about the budget and so on. So all people coming to Europe, being Europe, is centrally funded there. So in this way, maybe you can give, you, cannot, you will not give people like Salvini saying Italians are paying for migrants coming here. But you know, the answer which I had from politicians was zero. So no one <laughs> replied <laughs> to, 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 my, to, my, to my idea. So it's like, it's very hard for us. The only thing that I do and that I suggest, a couple of years ago, as I said, there was never replying. Now I think that everyone us to stand up and answer to this bullshit that sometimes is coming from the far right and so on. You know, answering to our neighbor when they say, you know, oh, I don't like black people. So we need to label them and say, okay, but you're a racist, full stop. So it is more individually driven today 
And maybe this slowly will come up and then mainstream politician will solve this strange situation. <laughs> we continue to have hope. Yeah. Yes. <laughs> but yeah. other things. Always saving up. Otherwise. Always. Linda. Yeah, I was actually thinking about this European Christian, because in, in the Netherlands we have that as well, right? We have uh, Geert Wilders. And I think uh, uh, calling upon this European Christian tradition is also a way to organize the people or to define the people. Because in populism, you pit the people against the elite, right? And, and the, the people are usually some kind of imagined heartland. It's, it's not clear who's part of the people. So you have to have some sort of definition. And indeed, then it's very strategic to just say, all people <laughs> adhering to the European Christian tradition, whatever that may be, right? So you're not even uh, part of a church or you're not even religious yourself, but you I'm still a member of the European tra uh, uh, Christian tradition, probably. But now I'm actually thinking, because you were talking about this transnational brotherhood of these populist movements in Europe, isn't it also strategic in that way? Because then it's not more the nationalist people, but, but but then you can say, oh, we're all, all these nations and all these people, all these citizens of these nations are part of this European Christian tradition that we should actually save and protect. So maybe it's even more of an international uh, strategy. I'm not quite sure. And in terms of what answers do you give or how do you counter this? Yeah, yeah. I thought it was a very interesting question, but also very difficult <laughs> yeah, uh, to answer. And I don't think that we should engage in identity politics ourselves, of course. Uh, and um, but it, it's a it's a it's a difficult question. And and maybe a way would be to uh, instead uh, draw lines and uh, make clear how groups in society that are defined as different are actually very similar and that there are similarities between you and your immigrant neighbor uh, who also has a family, right? And then maybe maybe talk about it like that. Maybe try to find more similarities between people, but I'm not sure whether that's really the solution because we all, you see that people, even with immigrant friends, for instance, still vote for these parties. So, uh, and they, they, so there are also other things at play there. Mark. Um, well, I, I agree with the, uh, the, what, for me, what, the way that I kind of, um, would phrase what you were talking about is like the sort of, at least what I've encountered is like the weaponization of religion. And, uh, so I, <clears throat> in the context of this sort of war of civilizations, that thing, the, the, this European war of civilizations that is evoked, and then there's this tradition of, I mean, the guy whose name we won't mention had scribbled all over his weapon. This, all these battles in this, in this, in this that fit into that narrative. And so there's um, there's this. That's a big theme in the far right is the kind of pan-European uh, cultural identity of Christianity. And then there are sort of uh, these kind of <clears throat> then like various strengths of that. <laughs> Or you can kind of get like the stronger version is the uh, seems to me to be like the uh, at least it was for a while the um, uh, Russian Orthodox that's like the real hard stuff <laughs> and uh, then uh, and then there's like Evola is like the real full that's when you just go right to the source or right to the uh, and that and and I've saw, seen a lot of that this kind of esoteric uh, stuff um, that having. And that's a rejection of Christianity as as well. Um, you know, I my uh, my my uh, own family history, at least on one side of my family, is from Latvia, which is a very small country. And uh, and Latvia, you go when you go there every five years, you go to this like this kind of pagan celebrate. Actually, every year they have the pagan celebration, but uh, every five years they have this big song festival. It's like extremely. It's basically like an advertisement for the kind of alt-right fantasy land of like white with, with torches and everything. But it's, but it's, it's not though, actually. It's not, so you, it, but it is, it, it is this kind of like traditionalist, it does fit into this whole traditionalist narrative that very much resonates with fascist uh, imaginary. And, and if you do the history, which I keep telling them and nobody listens to me, they, it goes back to the Volkish movement, which is, you know, a kind of also a common 
point for the for for Nazism, but it, it isn't necessarily like a fascist manifestation either. It's not as straightforward as that. And all esotericism isn't also Nazi or uh, fascist either. So these things, you know, they're complicated. Um, but there's certainly a weaponization of that. And as far as the, uh, in the right, I mean, and as far as the, the identitarian stuff goes, I, I did, we, we, we made a, a map of uh, all of the communications going on between all of the Facebook groups, starting from a expert list given to us by an expert of extremism work, that works for the Volkskant, uh, Dmitry Tokmetsis. And we then looked at who was commenting on whose page and then organized the network based on those links. And what emerged were, uh, you know, what you would expect. Like there was a sort of Italian cluster and Salvini was really big in the middle of that. Um, and, uh, and the, uh, and, but there was also this hugely organized identitarian cluster, extremely well organized. Um, and that was, that was something to take note of. Um, so yeah, they have, in my opinion, they have like the kind of, they've got the ground game, you know? So, and the alt-right, they're sort of good with the sort of, inf the kind of information warfare. And then I suppose that they kind of are looking to learn from one another in that regard. As far as the question about the imagination thing, I mean, that's, yeah, that's, that's what we're here for. I guess that's what we're doing. <laughs> we're imagining these, and um, hopefully they're adequate to contribute to this imaginary. Um, I don't know. I signed up for the European elections today. That, that's, that's a kind of a cool imaginary <laughs> idea that I'm into. Um, <laughs> Um, thank you for that. But actually, you know, and actually on the, I'll, I'll get to you in a second. I mean, I think on the point of the identitarians, I think it's really, to me, it's important also because, you know, it shows, again, the proximity to actual governing forces, whether in Austria or in Italy and other proximities that may be not as evident as not, you know, with, without kind of directly connecting personal biographies. Um, and, you know, I think one thing that... Um, all of you, in a sense, said is, you know, as a strategy of responding, it's really kind of calling the bullshit and calling a racist a racist, whether it's your neighbor or somebody writing on the newspaper, calling things by their name and, you know, kind of calling things out as well, which I think would be important. But I know there are a couple more questions. So you had a question and so did you. Where is the microphone there? So can you pass it to your colleague here in the front? Uh, yeah, my question is about uh actually the last thing we're talking about, the European elections. Yeah. And um, I'm wondering how worried do we have to be right now? Uh, how uh, we, we, <laughs> uh, we discovered in, in our work that we're doing, we discovered a group called Agenda Europe. I don't know if you've heard about it, but they're a very conservative group of people, very elusive but well-funded group of people who try to lobby against what you were saying also, uh, alternative families and uh, homosexuality, abortion, all those rights, they want to, you know, withdraw that, set the clock back, um, with a lot of links in the European Parliament. So do you know of any other ways or that they're actually influencing the policies right now in the European Parliament I'm talking about? Thank, thank you for that, which is a very important point, because, I mean, we, you know, we've touched upon you know, some of these discourses that we identify with the far right, which have to do, of course, with opposition to migration, to a you know, kind of dissolution imagined or otherwise of the nation. But the question of the family, which kind of goes back to you know, kind of questions of religiosity, is very important as well and feeds directly into kind of this demographic politics of, you know, so you're not only against, you know, the outsiders from the outside, but those within Europe who somehow don't, you know, are not part of the project as they should be, right? right. Whether the reproductive project or, you know, kind of certainly don't fit um, the, the proper model. And this group is certainly very important, but I'll, I'll let the, the, the panelists respond to that. And there was one more question here in the front, if you can pass on the mic. Hi. Um, I'd rather try and make a suggestion. Um, in my field, psychology, um, let's divide it into three sections. The um, meta level, the meso level, and the um, micro level on which to approach the subject or our d d diversity. Um, on a micro level, 
we take our customers very, very serious. So um, let's say there's a fascist opposite me, I would take them very seriously. And I would ask them lots of questions, which is something that all of us lack. I mean, it's very, very hard to ask people questions, yet it's so easy to just um, come out with your own opinions. But ask them for their, their opinions, and it's called LSD, actually. It's, um, it's a sort of a method, which <laughs> the D stands for dismantling. You take them seriously. You ask questions. And then you just, if they ask, if, if they come with, the, with an answer, you just go into that question. And therefore, you dismantle them. And, you know, they become more open because if it is resentment, then that's the way to break through their resentment. And so for us on the other side, to take these people very serious already opens up something in, that, in them. And that's, so it's a different approach, but I just wanted to mm -hmm. hear your opinion on it. Yeah. On a meso level, we've just seen this extraordinary thing in France, at least I thought it was extraordinary, the way that it's sort of a Raden Republic, you know, the old German Rosa Luxemburg thing, um, to where you see uh, Macron counseling in every city, in every village, in every, um, any little, right, there was, there were discussions everywhere. And apparently from what I gathered, it really, really worked. And one could institutionalize that. So to just get them, the, the community to really work and, and have that sort of an LSD approach within the community. And then obviously on a, mm, meta level, which would be politics, that I would just go for what you say, no legitimization. So there you see the three sort of levels on which you could approach things. Mm. Your comments. Thank you for that. Do we have one more there? Okay, yeah, let's, let's take one, one more, if you can pass it on, yeah. Right there in the corner. So I still wanted to ask about the idea of not stigmatizing and uh, because about a month ago there was Chantal Mouffe talking here about her for the leftist populism mm -hmm. and her idea was that we should not stigmatize and that populists should be also some uh, technique embraced also by the left but only in kind of developed liberal yeah. democracies. Yeah. Uh, so uh, for her, there was still like the Marine Le Pen or uh, was uh, populist, but, uh, or uh, yeah. Thierry Baudet, but uh, Orban or uh, Bolsonaro were yeah. fascist. So that was a bit uh, yeah. the distinction about the, mm -hmm. uh, also the political order that mm -hmm. she was making. So yeah. whether that would also fit. All right. Who would like to I, start? I, get, Mark, I would do like you want to start actually, I, because I would have liked to have been at that uh, event, but it was sold out. Uh, and uh, <laughs> I, I, um, I like. I've always liked that her theories. It seemed they seem very interesting to me. You know, it seems like a good way. At least it seemed for a long time a good way out of the whole kind of dead end scenario that she had diagnosed. But I also feel in looking at the what I call in these environments mimetic antagonism, that they are, there, is, there are environments in which antagonism, so well, let me step back. When she talks about agonism, there's a kind of an assumption that in engaging sort of in agonistically, that, you're gonna, that people are gonna play by the rules that they're not going, there's some things, there's like certain places where you won't go, but that is not the case with the, uh, many of these situations. And then, you know, the, then it, that just means that it's only really works within very, which I guess is the point that apparently she was making. So then, so it's like a theory that works within only very specific situations, and those situations I guess, I guess are getting smaller. Um, the, uh, I forgot what the other questions were. The uh, election, micro U election. Oh, oh, the, the, oh yeah, the levels. Yeah, that's <laughs> very interesting, the LSD levels. That's very interesting. I would like to work with 
you in the <laughs> LS, D levels. I'm, we, we, are, we have like a, when, you know, with media studies, like we're all always very far from everything, especially when it's all anonymous and you, you don't know who, who you're dealing with or why they're saying the things that they're saying or if they mean what they say. Or, so it's all like very distant and stuff. But I, uh, I went to a talk a little while ago it, that was at SPOW 25 uh, that Bogner was at as well, and uh, the, this was like a, a, a sort of one of the, main, the supposedly one of the the the, the key figures in the current discourse on on comparative fascist studies, and he advocated a methodology that he call, referred to as um, in, in methodological empathy towards fascists, uh, and this and uh, this was how he had been able to sort of understand them, and so uh, that I found interesting. Um, I do think you have to try to understand, but of course, when you have these multiple levels, then you can kind of indeed also engage with this not legitimizing thing, which is an issue for sure. Um, but to me, I always feel like the legitimizing thing is more like the problem for the journalists, you know, where it's like they are, you're going, you, the danger is to propagate their memes from where we stand. But I mean, not that many people read my stuff, so I don't feel like that I have, that I'm that much of a node in that in their kind of you know plan there was a third one about the european elections i would like to learn about the this party and what they're doing i think that that when i looked at the mo recent elections in the dutch elections i saw some very strange things in the way that the parties the dutch parties show up on youtube if you do a search on youtube for the, the, the channel of, a Dutch, of any of the 13 Dutch parties, and you look in the column on the side where it says recommended parties for all parties except for two, which is Forum and Green Links, YouTube will recommend to you Forum. And that's a few, go ahead, check it out. <laughs> uh, and uh, so I don't know exactly how the, these things work, if it's a question of strategy, if it's a question of past sort of behavior that the algorithm is kind of uh, crunching, but um, I, it's worthwhile seeing those kinds of things in relation to various parties going into the, the European elections. And um, maybe we'll get, we have, would have a glimpse of what is to come. Hopefully these things are, there's not gonna be any big surprises in store. Linda, do you want to give yeah. us a prognosis? Yeah, no, I have, I have to say, I don't. I, I think we should just keep following the polls, and it's it's difficult. <laughs> yeah, that, that's what I do. <laughs> I think it's very difficult to predict what will happen, but I think that the, the the idea that we're getting right now and the the like the distribution we see right now, I don't expect real big changes, right? I don't think that uh, this this lobby organization. I don't know, but I don't think they can really impact now uh, impact anything right now before the elections anymore, but maybe afterwards, right? But we know that there are many lobby organizations working in Europe, in Brussels, trying to uh, um, yeah, persuade uh, all those people working there. Um, and they, they, are very, they have a very strong impact. And I think, in general, we talk about that too little. And we don't know about that that much. Uh, and, and that's very important to discuss, I think. But that's a different topic. <laughs> um, about the micro, meso, macro level, I think that's very interesting. Uh, also, also doing LSD mm. on all these <laughs> three levels. Um, what I think it's indeed important to take uh, people seriously, and, uh, and of course I'm talking not about these very extreme far right people, but just people uh, voting for Jerry Baudet, for instance. Um, and also take their grievances uh, serious and talk to them uh, about them and uh, try to make them understand what's really going on and, and try to indeed dismantle their ideas. Also, uh, be because we know that the, uh, these people voting for these parties are pe people that feel that they are left out for some reason. I think it's very important to talk to them about this feeling. So what, what are they what, what, yeah, what are they afraid of? So in, in general, there's, they're afraid of something and we should discuss with them. And I think indeed, the macro level, uh, there's a lot of research on, in political science, as I said, about uh, other parties legitimizing these, the, the immigration issue, also uh, yeah, mainstream media legitimizing that issue, and we know that, uh, that that also gives rise to these parties, right? If the mainstream media wouldn't discuss the immigration issue as much as they do, then these parties would be smaller. So um, that's a large part of the problem as well. 
Um, but the meso level, I think that's actually more interesting because we don't discuss this that much. And there is research on um, more political science research on people uh, living in certain areas, uh, but more on uh, how that affects them, right? So if they live in an urban area or a rural area, are they more likely to vote for these parties? If they have more immigrant friends or less immigrant friends, if they have immigrant colleagues or not, right? does that, that affect them or how they view immigrants, for instance? But how we can actually have some kind of intervention at that level, we, we rarely discuss that. And I think it's very interesting also in the idea of more deliberative democracy and uh, more experiments like that. And I think, yeah, it's very, it would be good to have some kind of experiment uh, <laughs> like that, some kind of field experiment. I see something, <laughs> yeah, yeah, very interesting. Mm -hmm. No, thank you for that. And I think, you know, once more kind of thinking one, you know, how context matters. So yeah. it's not I mean, we really do tend to think yeah, maybe I because there is a there. Fo there is a focus both on the online spaces and also on, you know, the transnational linkages that exist. But these things, you know, kind of take root in specific places yeah. for specific reasons. Andrea. Well, so I start from the from the, the last question. So should we make a case for a left populism, which is the... My answer is no a million times. <laughs> so is no, 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 up to tomorrow morning. <laughs> yeah. I share some of the moves, ideas, and so on. I think that certainly we need to look at things properly. There are problems eventually to be discussed. Uh, I think that one of the problems today is that the, you risk to be labeled as a populist simply if you challenge, for example, the status quo, because the idea is that you know, only liberalism exists. But on the other hand, I think that you know, uh, was socialism international? When socialism for some became national, it ended up not very well. Uh, and I think that you know, today, if from the left, you start using some of, of some of such rhetoric. I mean, you are not doing anything because such rhetoric is associated with the right and people will keep voting for the right. We're not voting for a small fringe of leftists saying we need to dismantle the European Union, we need to do that and that. In Italy, there has been recently a politician from the left calling for this anti-Euro agenda and so on. And he called it constitutional nationalism. What is constitutional nationalism? Today, people don't understand what is nationalism. When you talk about constitutional nationalism, you are talking with other three people in your room, probably. And I think that this is extremely problematic. Plus, I don't think that you know, what some left-wing populists did so far was so appealing. <laughs> Look at Brexit, for example. Some of the traditional left in Britain, since the 50s actually, used always the same agenda. You might agree or disagree, that's another point, which is, you know, Europe is too liberal. If we join Europe, if, you know, uh, we will not be able to do social, socialistic like policy, social democratic policy and so on. I think that this could make sense in the 50s, but as some people have done today, is completely bullshit, and I repeat this word, bullshit, because you can go out of the European Union only if you are honest enough to win an election the day after and implement a socialist or a social democratic state in your country. What the British left did was outrageous, because the risk is that all protection for labor, for the labor will be destroyed if conservative will win again out of the European Union. So the blame is also on them. And I don't think that you know, uh, major people should follow any of these populist lines. Then, I'm very passionate about the thing because you know, Brexit, you know, living in Britain, I see what, are, what is the impact of Brexit in Europeans living in Britain. So uh, the question about the European election, you know, my last prediction was about Brexit <laughs> not winning, so I, don't, I will never make a prediction <laughs> in my personal life. <laughs> but, but you know, like the question was good, and also the, 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 the movement that you mentioned 
is the the the, the, the pressure group. I, I I heard something about it. I am not sure what impact that they can have. I think that you know once more the problem is about what mainstream party will do and how they will react. A major problem is I repeat it once more within the mainstream center right Christian Democrats within the European Union because they have people like Corbyn, they have people like Silvio Berlusconi, and people even like Silvio Berlusconi, considered by Europe's People Party at some point, which means, you know, like the madness of some of the Europe leadership. They went to Italy to, you know, legitimize against Silvio Berlusconi during the electoral campaign in Italy, considering Berlusconi a barrier against populism. Silvio Berlusconi, a barrier against public. You need to be mad. I mean, go back to the elementary school and restart from the beginning. But, you know, so I think that that is a huge, but that is being seen, that is a huge problem because there is part of Europe, people, European People Party, who potentially wants to have a joint coalition in the next European Parliament with Salvini, and Salvini is working, as I showed, to broaden this, uh, this, this, this anti-EU agenda. So that's, in my view, is extremely problematic. I think that they should study a bit of history, because when, uh, in the interwar years, some conservatives were sure of controlling fascists, it didn't end up very well for democracy. Uh, my last point is about the, the, um, your uh, suggestions. Well, the only thing that I can say, thank you very much for sharing <laughs> it and write a couple of articles and be willing <laughs> to know more about it. Maybe it's one of the solutions. Thanks. Thank you for that. And I think um, we, we have to end, but this is a very good way to do it because I think it allows us to quite substantially extend our understanding, our own imagination of where the spaces of the right lie, which you know I would agree with you, also stretch into the EPP and other institutional actors who are complicit very much in producing these spaces and allowing these agendas to circulate. So a huge thank you to the three speakers who fielded all these questions. Thank you to ECF for organizing this, and thanks to all of you for um, participating and bringing us great discussion questions. <laughs>